Hi everyone. So today we're going to have a little bit of a look at the concept of functional equivalence and why that's a useful concept to know about and how it can be useful to you in uh, your therapy. So we've talked in previous videos about uh, thinking functionally about behavior and how understanding the function of a behavior helps to kind of guide us in therapy and in our interventions. And when we talk about functional behavior, of course, I'm just referring to uh, the range of consequences or impacts that a particular behavior has on the outer or inner uh, environments that we experience. So when we've talked about the functions of behavior, one of the next steps that we can take is to think about uh, functional equivalence. And what I mean by that is, is that we often can have different behaviors uh, that a person is engaging in, which all serve the same function. Uh, and when we kind of have that, or when we sort of uncover that in people's lives, we can kind of group those behaviors together as classes, where each behavior that's in that class, which could be a behavior that looks very different on the surface, uh, but which all serve that kind of same function. So as a quick example, just to illustrate this, uh, so let's say you're working with a client maybe who has grown up um, in, a, in an environment which has really uh, reinforced and perpetuated a fear of emotional experiencing in general. So a client maybe who has grown up uh, being sort of punished or humiliated for any expression of emotion, or they've been taught that uh, experiencing strong emotions reflects a, a lack of self-control uh, and is, is generally kind of a negative pathological thing. So you may have had someone growing up with a general aversion to any intense emotion. And this client may do a whole bunch of things in order to try and avoid or not make contact with intense emotions. Now, some of those things might include substance use or self-harm uh, or even suicidal behavior uh, or situational avoidance, maybe not engaging in, in social activities because of the fear of uh, being judged or feeling anxious around other people. Uh, or it might include things like avoiding therapy sessions uh, because of the fear of um, the emotions that might be elicited during those conversations. Or it might be changing direction in a conversation with the therapist or um, being selective about the information that they disclose to the therapist uh, so that the therapist won't ask particular questions about subjects which might elicit more distress. So all of those behaviors, which all look very different, the behavior of changing direction in a conversation looks entirely different to the behavior of say self-harm or, or substance abuse. Uh, and yet those behaviors may still be functioning to try and distance that client from emotional experiencing, which they're finding very aversive. Uh, and you'll notice that some of those behaviors occur uh, in the client's life outside the therapy room. And some of them are behaviors which actually occur inside the therapy room with the therapist as part of the therapy relationship. And that will be relevant for something we'll talk about in a few minutes. But this is one of the ways we can think about functional equivalence, that behaviors which can look very different topographically, so we might say they have a different form or topography, uh, but have the same function. And it's useful for us to, uh, to be able to kind of think in terms of functional equivalence for a few different reasons. Uh, the first reason really is that it can be a really nice way of simplifying the conceptualization uh, for the client and for the therapist. So uh, as a way of uh, the client say noticing, if we're looking at avoidance, say for example, as a functional class, uh, you know, once a client is able to kind of recognize, and if you've collaboratively agreed that that's a class of behaviors you're wanting to look at and work on, then being able to kind of group them together makes it easier for the client to kind of spot those behaviors for them to say, oh, okay, yeah, that was, a, that was definitely a, a moment of avoidance, as opposed to having them kind of track, you know, really individual behaviors. Uh, so it's a nice way of noticing that generally. It's a good shorthand for the therapist to be able to bring the client's attention to those things. Uh, you know, for the therapist to be able to ask the client, was that a bit of an avoidance move? Was that, a, was that an example of you kind of doing this? We might even use a physical metaphor like that to, to summarize an entire functional class of behaviors. Uh, and also you can use it to stipulate uh, behaviors that are more adaptive that the client is wanting to do more of in their lives as well. Uh, and, and actually you might already even be aware of uh, the, some of the terminology that is used. We can create hugely broad functional classes. Sometimes in contextual behavioral therapies, uh, therapists might talk about towards moves and away moves. 
so towards moves being any behaviors which kind of uh, bring an individual kind of closer to things that are meaningful or important or of value to them in their lives and away moves being kind of behaviors which move a person away from uh, those important things in their lives. And even when we're doing that, we're, in, we're engaging in some equivalence classes, very broadly speaking. Uh, Second reason that it can be useful to think in terms of equivalence classes is that thinking in terms of equivalence helps us build a bridge between things that are happening inside the therapy room and things that are happening outside the therapy room. So as clinicians, uh, one of the difficulties that we have is that often the problem behaviors that we're faced with or that our clients are struggling with in their day-to-day -day life mostly are happening outside the therapy room. Uh, so if someone's engaging in, in you know, substance use or self-harm or, or those kinds of behaviors, uh, they're unlikely to be doing those behaviors in the room with you. They're most likely kind of happening out there, uh, which, which definitely limits our capacity to be able to actually get in and intervene on those behaviors directly when they're kind of occurring. Uh, so thinking in terms of functional equivalence, we may not be able to work with those behaviors directly, but if we, can, if we can learn to understand how those behaviors are functioning, and by that I mean, what are the kinds of antecedent conditions that tend to be occurring when those behaviors are present? What kinds of consequences do those behaviors have, especially what are the reinforcing consequences that are maintaining those behaviors? Then we can start to kind of replicate some of those conditions in the therapy room uh, so that we can kind of see functionally equivalent behaviors occurring in the room. And you will get, you will hear lots of different opinions about this uh, when you uh, hear different people talk about behavioral therapies in terms of, should we only focus on behaviors occurring inside the room? Should we also be interested in behaviors occurring outside the room? And you will get a lot of different views. Uh, personally, I think one of the useful things about uh, thinking in, in those ways is that both arenas give us important information. So behavior outside the room or hearing about behavior outside the room can orient us towards behaviors inside the room which are relevant and give us useful information that we can use to do that. So, so as an example, a clinical example might be, so let's say you're working with a client, so let's call the client uh, Angela, who's not a real client, it's a combination of different clients that I've worked with over the years. Uh, so I was talking to Angela in an initial session uh, about her life outside the room and she made a comment to me about how she packed her grocery trolley when she does grocery shopping. So she commented that she always packs her grocery trolley in a, in a particular way. And I kind of got a little bit curious about that and asked about, yeah, what, what, what is it that kind of, you know, tell me about that, packing a trolley in that way, what's that about? Uh, and she mentioned that she used to have to pack her trolley a certain way uh, many years ago when she was in a relationship with her abusive ex-partner uh, and that, that she would always get in trouble if she packed the, the trolley in a way which was incorrect, according to him. So she learned how to, to pack the trolley in ways which would appease him or which would keep her safe or which would minimize the, the chance of him having an outburst. Uh, and so this was a behavior happening outside the therapy room. And so we kind of maybe hypothesized uh, that this was you know, a safety behavior. This behavior served to kind of help her feel safer and, and actually reduce the likelihood that she was at risk. Knowing that, I guess the, the, the curiosity is, okay, is that behavior completely unique or does Angela engage in other behaviors which also serve that same function of helping her kind of to, to feel safe in that situation? And are there other behaviors outside the therapy room and are there other behaviors inside the therapy room? Now, uh, knowing that that was happening outside the room meant that I was able to be more alert or oriented to behaviors happening inside the room, which might have also been functioning as kind of safety behaviors or appeasing behaviors. And we identified a few that Angela would do things in the room, like she would speak very quietly uh, when she was talking in the room to me because she used to get in trouble for, for being too loud. Uh, or she would uh, say, avoid uh, telling me about difficult things happening in her life because she used to get in trouble for complaining or whinging. Uh, so there were things that she was doing in the room which served a similar function and learning a little bit about her behavior outside of the room was a way of, of kind of you know, alerting me or orienting me to some of those contingencies inside the room. And of course it can work the other way as well. Learning about some of those behaviors inside the room can mean that we're then directed towards uh, kind of having a, a bit more specific direction on where to look outside the room for behaviors that might be kind of clinically relevant or, or meaningful.
So this is just a quick little uh, introduction to the idea of, of functional equivalence and, and some of the ways that it can kind of be helpful to understand that and use that in the therapy room. Uh, if these ideas are of interest to you, then certainly feel free to subscribe to my YouTube channel or check out my website where we kind of uh, look at practical ways of bringing these ideas into the therapy room uh, with your clients or keep an eye out for future videos where we'll be looking at more uh, contextual behavioral science concepts and, and how they're relevant to you as a therapist. Thanks for watching.